Hi everyone, my name is Kate Cradson, the still fairly new curator at Brown's David Winton Fellow Gallery. Today I'm joined by Jamie Lee Lacey, the Director and Chief Curator of Providence College Galleries and Collections, Dominic Malone, the Richard Brown Baker Curator of Contemporary Art at the RISD Museum, and Jeremy Radke, Assistant Director, Digital Initiatives at the RISD Museum. I also want to take a moment to thank Ian Budish and Nishan Hale of the Bell Gallery for facilitating this Zoom and mention that, unfortunately, Esther Eikhoff, whose title is Global Creative Lead at Art Basel, is unable to join us. And though Esther's title and position is quite international, she is based here in Providence, within walking distance of my apartment, which is down the block from the RISD Museum and Bell Gallery, which is a long but doable walk to the Providence College Galleries. My point is that I wanted to gather local colleagues working in contemporary art for this conversation, though we all know of incredible work currently being done around online exhibition making across the country. And I think the first person that we want to hear from is Jeremy, because not only did he work on, and I think it's still in production, the Webby nominated, um, Webby Award nominated Raid the Icebox Now exhibition, you are also working to facilitate online exhibitions of a lot of RISD students right now. So I know you're going to cover that at the end of your presentation, but I think all of us would love to see uh, what you've worked on previously, currently, and in the future. Cool. Um, <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Jeremy Radke. Um, uh, I'm the Assistant Director of Digital Initiatives at the museum. What that means um, is that I'm in charge of um, all of uh, the digital infrastructure and digital interpretation that the museum does. So that's anything from our website to our online collection to our, the video and audio content that we produce. Um, and I just wanted to show a couple of really quick um, projects that we worked on recently, um, just to uh, kind of like frame um, my position a little bit and um, how I'm intersecting, um, just to get the conversation started. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen really quick. So we have had um, a bunch of tries at um, moving our exhibitions online. Um, these are two very early iterations of that. Um, be it, this is our um, artsy uh, profile um, where we used to um, try to um, talk about our exhibitions um, and provide content, um, both like interpretive content um, and also like gallery installation images online. Um, and this is um, one of the exhibitions that we uh, have uh, translated um, into Google Arts and Culture. Um, and this uh, is um, Artist Rebel Dandy, um, Man of Fashion, an exhibition that the museum did maybe like six years ago now. Um, and from my perspective, um, <clears throat> both um, interpretive, uh, in the interpretive um, and curatorial perspective on this is that these are not actually representative of um, uh, what we see as success. Um, uh, while it's important to reach new audiences for us, um, uh, these don't really frame us in a way that um, feels um, that it communicates the richness of the exhibition. They're pretty static. Um, the direct translation mostly, if you take a look over here, shows a bunch of empty galleries, or if you take a look over here, takes an exhibition and makes it into something that feels like a PowerPoint. Um, and that, um, again, like doesn't really like communicate the richness of, of, of our work. Um, and so I just wanted to use that as an opening to talk about a project that we feel a little bit better about. Um, this is something that the museum has uh, released um, a couple of months ago, um, so it's still pretty fresh to us. Um, it's uh, a online publication um, that uh, is an extension of um, the Ray the Icebox Now exhibition that the museum has. Um, and this is, was a very different structure than the projects that I mentioned which again was like more of a direct translation. Um, this was um, uh, more of uh, a invitation to an artist to um, participate in an extended relationship with the museum um, and allowing like a tremendous amount of access to the collection and um, uh, to the museum's resources to generate not only like a physical exhibition um, at the museum, but also simultaneously work on a digital project with us. Um, and that's represented in all of the chapters um, in this publication. Um, and I just wanted to showcase um, 
a couple of these just so that we, uh, you know, I could share some of the various ways that we've been working um, with artists um, on uh, online. Um, and so the first I want to talk about really quick is Beth Kettleman. Um, Beth Kettleman is a ceramicist um, traditionally who um, has um, came to us with the intention of making a, a process video um, for her video or for her um, online um, project. She um, makes these really beautiful, delicate pieces um, using one part uh, or two part uh, molds, and she wanted to just show how people to people how how that's made. Um, as we jumped into the project, we very quickly pivoted um, and instead like uh, worked with uh, her in a completely new medium, something that she's totally not used to um, being video to offer a, um, a uh, and to collaborate uh, with her in making a satirical tour for the Pendleton House um, in which her uh, her exhibition was installed. And so you can see over here. Um, this very 1990s feeling website um, mm -hmm. that is intentionally crafted that way. Um, that kind of uh, uh, also has like a online tour of her exhibition space. Um, and oops, sorry. All of a sudden, I'm having a bit of difficulty. There we go. Um, another one I just wanted to share is Pablo Bronstein. Um, Pablo Bronstein um, uh, used this invitation with us um, uh, and used the online space to make, make new work that complemented his, his exhibition and his installation. He used the installation in the, in the museum as a backdrop uh, for a dance performance um, that you can see uh, in this video below. Um, he, um, uh, Pablo uh, considered this a new work uh, for himself and um, other projects that he's done online, he he thought of as being documentation of a physical exhibi exhibition rather than an actual piece of work that he's interested in in um, showing elsewhere outside of the publication. Um, and this was something that, um, again, like used the resources of our team um, to kind of uh, film and make. And and it, there was a back and forth um, between us and the artist in making that piece. Um, and then I. Just wanted to also show Nicole Eisman. Um, this is a, a something that we made where it was more of an artist um, providing um, us a prompt to build off of, where the museum was actually more the generator of this content than the artists themselves. Um, um, and uh, Nicole uh, uh, is, was interested in showcasing her connections to the city of Providence um, as it connected to the themes in her exhibition and offered um, a prompt to a local artist uh, to explore the 19, the gay scene in the 1990s in Providence through original writing and video vignettes. And so you kind of get the, the idea here. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to talk about Pablo Hoguera, who um, uh, use the digital publication to further dive into uh, artistic research um, by engaging in deep personal um, uh, conversations in the homes of artists and actually bringing our team along with them. And so the, this chapter of the publication was more about um, uh, like documentation of, of his own process in exploring the themes of, of an exhibition. Um, and then uh, and so these are all different ways that we were working with artists and something I've felt a little bit more real. Definitely like we're grounded in people, um, less of a one way um, communication than the previous things that I, I was sharing. Um, and this is this way of working has um, more recently come in handy um, as RISD has um, been moving all of its like graduating students to an online platform. Uh, to show their work and 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 their culmination of their time here at RISD. And so we have been also um, uh, uh, taking all of the 700 graduating students and 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 speaking to them and working with them individually on how and 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 figuring out how to translate their their work online. And we're doing it through the two different publications. This one is for our undergrads and this one is, for our graduate students. Um, so, and that uh, work is only able to be done um, because uh, of the, uh, 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 the 
responsiveness and nimbleness that we kind of learned from from the other projects that we were doing with Ray the Icebox is so quick that it almost meant nothing. But I I ju tried to jump through all of that for you just to kind of um, get the conversation started. Nearly all of our questions that we have been sending to each other leading up to our conversation um, intersect with uh, your presentation just now. So I feel like we could go in any direction, but I'm actually curious um, going to something we talked about before we started recording, which is that you refer to this as a publication and not as an exhibition, and that's very deliberate. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's something that for, uh, for all, all of our undergrads and graduate students, they've actually really resonated, has really resonated with them. Publication seems more important, or a project seems like a little bit nebulous and could be anything. Um, and so exhibitions feel like something. And there's certain expectations that are tied to them that, um, uh, that when they're not met, um, people feel disappointed. Um, and um, especially like students who have been working in, um, for years at, at getting to this moment of an exhibition and um, for that not to have any sort of like connection to the physical world is slightly, yeah, underwhelming. And who did you work with to put the publications together? And of course, my angle as a curator with two other curators in the conversation is, is it curated? Because that's a word that's thrown around, you know, coffee's curated, or CD collection. I, you, that, it just aged me, right? No CDs behind me, but your music collection is curated. Um, it, was there an actual curatorial uh, direction given in these or is 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 its lack of um the reason that you went with publication not the publications aren't curated we all know that beautiful publications require that that level of engagement and um, narrative as well yeah um it, it it's it's it the red the icebox um exhibition is curated um yeah. obviously it um raise your hand um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> there is there the, one of the curators is in in the chat with us, um, and 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 so this is actually an extension of the curatorial process. Is this publication? Yeah, and you know, it really kind of grew out of um, in in parallel with the conversations that we were having. Each of the curators who were working on you know the different projects, um, you know, Jeremy and his team were folded into. Um, conversations that we were having with, in my case, uh, Nicole Eisenman and Simone Lee, um, and really kind of in keeping with the exhibitions, you know, kind of ethos of, you know, giving them the platform to do whatever they wanted to do, to do um, with our collection and within the space that we were giving them, you know, we also, you know, wanted them to, you know, really kind of direct us into which direction they wanted to take um, with the with the digital publication. And so, um, you know, for Simone, it was a way to, I think, activate, you know, some things that weren't able to happen within her exhibition proper uh, with Nicole, as Jeremy indicated, you know, kind of reminded me of the process that like the graphic designer Peter Saville would do for like, the band New Order, um, where he really, they had no like kind of direct involvement. So he just kind of, you know, did a riff on, on you know, kind of the style and sensibility of whatever album. And I think, you know, with Nicole's project, you know, it really was a, it, it has this really successful way of, I think, kind of not only without showing the exhibition, embodying the feel and, and the inspiration for it, um, you know, in a way that I think kind of um, it was really nice because it, it 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 didn't just do this very kind of you know rote like documentation of it, yeah. but instead kind of weirdly distilled the the spirit and and sensibility of it almost from it, it felt like you know kind of either someone who had seen the exhibition and sort of took it into their own direction, uh, but also like what would happen if you describe like what Nicole was going to do to, you know, someone from another planet. And then they decided to kind of put this yeah. thing together. So, you know. 
And Dominic, one of the things I love about your catalog essay is that it really centers the importance of a catalog as a document of an exhibition, because you write about the historical importance of the original Raid the Icebox yeah. exhibition catalog and how its interpretation changed over time in both um, reinforcing the importance of that show, but also expanding its meaning as other people adopted mm -hmm. that language, the icebox language, or artist curated projects. I wonder if you could talk about that and how you can think about this 2020 moving to online as an example of this permanent archive that is developing right now and how that mm -hmm. might be meaningful yeah. in the future. Well, it's funny because I think that's one way that, you know, the digital publication for Raid the Icebox now is kind of functioning for us. You know, we have these wonderful projects that artists and designers and composers did, you know, sitting idle at the museum, yet the exhibition is able to have this other life, uh, which we thought was going to be kind of an afterlife, but is actually kind of functioning as a way for people to still, you know, kind of experience the show, even though, you know, the doors are closed because of COVID. Um, and I think it's interesting the way that the way that Jeremy talked about, you know, the sort of level of disappointment that students might have had to not have this exhibition opportunity. Yet there's this very kind of graceful opportunity for them to have something in a weird way, even more than they might have had um, with a sort of physical exhibition, which is up for like, a, like split second it seems except for like a week at the convention center or wherever it would have been held um this year and instead it's something that will perhaps have the opportunity to have a certain longevity to be able to be experienced not just by people who come to providence but you know to kind of expand beyond this those boundaries right and that takes us into a conversation around audience which has come up again and again as we shared um, questions and ideas leading up to this and i know as a lot of us participate in zoom chats across the country and across the world what's happening with our audience um jimmy lee posed some really fantastic questions in our email correspondence i don't know if you want to ask them but i know that all of us are concerned with the loss of certain audiences who maybe don't have access to um, high-speed internet for live uh, video or Zooming. Access to Zoom in general, I know, can be complicated if you're not licensed. Um, but also the opportunities that accessibility through uh, online exhibition platforms and videos and events allow other communities that maybe weren't physically able or the hurdles of not having closed captioning um, in the in our events or um, you know sign language um, I think that's that's going to be brought into a conversation for when we reopen physically in a way that it hadn't been previously I wonder if you could um, elaborate on that sure um when I was posing those questions in our uh, preliminary conversations, I was thinking a lot about um, some of the actual data that we have access to. So we tend to know who visit our exhibitions. Uh, Providence College Galleries sits on the hub or as at the nexus of um, an older um, Immigrate, immigrant oriented community in the city of Providence, as well as the historically black communities in the city of Providence. Um, and uh, most of these community members are middle class or working class. And we see a large number of um, off campus audiences that include senior citizens who can walk to the galleries and um, high schoolers and middle schoolers who can walk to the galleries after school. So we know that we're losing engagement with those communities. And just for a little context um, for the audience, Providence College Galleries is only five years old. Um, galleries have always been at Providence College um, in some capacity or another, but uh, this program was formalized um, as a quasi-museum program in 2015. So the relationships that we've built with our off-campus communities um, are fresh and new and really important, so we want to keep those up. Um, with our on-campus communities, um, we've actually seen from 
um, data that can be tracked on our website, on social media, that um, we're engaging more students and faculty than we ever have. Um, the put, you know, us pushing online content, even through email newsletters, uh, seem more of our on-campus community knows who we are and what we're doing than ever before. So um, since those shifts are happening, I've just been thinking a lot about producing content that can be engaged with not just as promotion, um, which even if we produce educational or um, you know, creative content online, it often ends up seeming like marketing or promotional content. Um, and I, I want to figure out ways to sort of keep communities, grow communities, but also not take advantage of, you know, our students' propensity for sitting in front of their smartphones and computers all day long. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, 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 I feel you there. Um, <laughs> the RISD, uh, um, while it is an institution that's 140 whatever years old, um, and has been exhibiting that entire time. Um, our digital online presence um, is only about six years old. We barely had a website um, uh, until that point. Um, and so our online collection, all of those, those efforts that we've made um, has been an extension of our audience. And we're currently um, looking at our analytics like split um, where 50% of our online audience is interested in getting into the building and 50% of it isn't. They're looking at our exhibitions um, and they're looking at um, like our exhibition history, not just our what's on, on view now, and also our collection. And looking and trying to understand the needs of that audience is hard. Um, mm -hmm. I have no idea what, what, why they're coming to our website. Um, and I can look at the analytics and say, and kind of like pretend and say, well, this person um, visited this site before they got to my site and they're, and Google thinks they're interested in travel. Um, but I really don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you extend that to all of the online platforms, not just our, our website, but talk about our YouTube channel, talk about our Vimeo channel, talk about like artsy, talk about Google culture, talk about like whatever, like those are all different audiences and those platforms have um, built in expectations. And even if you're looking at things that are doing similar, similar um, work like Vimeo and YouTube, they're different audiences. And mm -hmm. of what people expect on Vimeo is not what they expect on YouTube. And so it's kind of like um, sometimes, um, our actions are completely planned and thought through. And sometimes it's a crapshoot to yeah. figure out like what we're, and we're just figuring out it as we're going along. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, and and I, just, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say more to your point about accessibility, Kate, is that um, we have both institutionally um, and sort of as a field been resistant to um, incorporating accessibility measures into online content, whether that's closed captioning uh, for video content or closed captioning for images on the website. Um, uh, and we've realized, well, I think we always knew it's not that difficult to um, meet some of those needs, but it hasn't been a priority until now for society at large. Um, so we've been, my very small team and I have been thinking very carefully about um, how do we um, start using these tools in a way that's sustainable when this, when our priority is not online content anymore. Um, how do we make sure that we keep doing it? How do we make sure that the institution and the grant makers and the donors that we're working with um, see it as something valuable to go forward when we're out of this um, current crisis? And sustainability is such an important point to make as well, because I know that we are all lucky that we are employed by our institutions because so many of our colleagues have been furloughed or laid off and those positions might never come back. Um, however, we are all wearing many hats right now and 
um, learning new skills uh, to participate in this um, shutdown, but still very active online culture that's happening in museums and galleries across the country. Uh, I'm just going to give a shout out because I know as institutions struggle to find uh, work um, at home for people who maybe were front desk and um, visitor services staff or um, crew or security. Uh, the Bell, we've all been working to do alt text for our 6,500 objects in our collection. There's been some wonderful programming. I've been giving a shout out every time I do an online um, talk about this because I think that you're right, sustainability is an issue, but in this moment where maybe those hours aren't available for every worker in your institution, these are the moments where you can pivot one of the um, bingo terms of, of the shutdown uh, and have staff work towards these goals collectively. Um, and yes, we're not going to get 6,500 objects alt text written this summer, but you can make a dent and you can, like you said, show your audiences and your administration and your donors that, that this is important and that this, this um, momentum needs to keep going after this moment and after we reopen. Mm -hmm. I think also um, all of the anxiety and sadness um, of this current moment aside, there are um, really interesting opportunities for us to be better at our jobs. Um, I have learned in the last six weeks that um, a lot of the students, especially who are my, you know, most are the core of our audience, um, we're learning to meet them where they are, which is they love looking at things on their screens. Um, we want them in the galleries. We want, we want them looking at IRL objects, but they love looking at art and uh, content online. And I think that we need to recognize uh, that in many ways, we're kind of meeting some demands of our audience that we were unwilling to acknowledge before. Um, that kind of breaks my heart to say, but <laughs> it's something that um, we, we were just getting ready to complete a strategic plan. And this has made us realize that we needed to go back and do some serious editing because we can see how much our student and faculty community is enjoying um, the curated curatorial content online. So we have to take it seriously um, beyond COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, it's been interesting in other places where art gets shown to see changes that have kind of happened in terms of accessibility in other ways. You know, I've been kind of looking, I've been kind of visiting uh, art fairs um, uh, that have been done virtually, both Freeze and I think the Nada Fair just opened today. Um, but it's but what, what's been really kind of fascinating is the sort of transparency uh, of art of the prices, um, <laughs> which is uh, I mentioned to to one of the dealers. She's like, "What did you think of it?" And I said, "You know, I think it's like, you know, it's actually been really kind of helpful for those of us who do have to kind of manage, you know, collections to grow and cultivate museum collections to really have a a, a better." larger field of vision in terms of like what things actually cost. And, um, and I think that, you know, I was talking to our director about it and he's like, yeah, that's going to be a hard one for them to walk back uh, in terms of, you know, how the expectations that, that are going to be set by, by some of these things. But I think there's also been, you know, it's been really amazing to see like video kind of come back because it's something that, you know, is an available sort of, art format um, that works well within this. You know, it's like, again, going to like exhibitions and especially art fairs, like video has been kind of like shunted aside and now it's kind of had this really lovely comeback. Um, and also some of the ways that you can do kind of more focused, almost deep dives or de you know, somebody had mentioned details. Um, you know, I think there are ways that, you know, it has, it's, it's, a, terrible predicament we're all in, but I think there have been ways that the technological response to it uh, in terms of presenting art has opened a few little doors. 
No, I completely agree. I wanted to tell you one of my highlights was uh, revisiting Jeremy Deller's Depeche Mode documentary oh, that yeah. the Modern Institute had online. Dom and yeah. I are big Depeche Mode fans, and that's and Jeremy Deller fans. Jeremy Deller. <laughs> well, oh, I'm a Depeche Mode fan. I'm okay. ashamed. Um, but yeah, Jeremy. We brought Jeremy's, uh, collectively brought Jeremy's survey show to the United States about six years ago, was it? Six, seven years ago at different institutions. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it's kind of, uh, and I think it's a lot of that kind of work to get seen in a kind of context where you can actually see it, where you can actually spend uh, a certain, you know, degree of time with it. So, yeah. And also kind of maybe, I can just say this from personal experience, dissolving the boundaries I had between what, to allow, how to allow our artworks to circulate, our collection works and our exhibition images to circulate in the world. I've been really open to our curatorial fellow who's 15 years younger than me and her ideas about what we should be doing on social media. We're about to launch um, access to the Bells collection through Animal Crossing, which I can give, I can't even give you a one sentence exclamation, people build worlds, right? I don't, do any of you play this? I know it's all ages. It's not just, it's not just uh, millennials um, who are playing Animal Crossing, but the Getty allowed their collection to be curated in Animal Crossing and the Bell actually is able to do the same. So we'll be launching that this coming week and it might be this you know smash hit of giving access to especially brown students who um and perhaps you can all speak to this we all think about publics beyond our university and college campuses but in this moment i'm actually really thinking hard about um about the brown community and that that's yeah. really become our priority and and it was always the priority but really you know, you know, the administration wants um, everyone to give students, staff, and faculty a sense of community, even though we're spread across the world. And we are spread across the world. I'm seeing people log into our um, website and check out our archives from every continent, for the most part, uh, every week when I check the analytics. Yeah. And that's that's really exciting to me that um, that there is this enthusiasm. And like you said, Jamie Lee, maybe it's just that we're we're accepting that students want to access things online and that as much as we want them through the door um, and every single one of them to come through the door at one point during our exhibitions this is this is a a shift that we have to accept and kind of build on as we reopen um i think also that um we've been thinking of providence college galleries as this you know newer institution in a pretty storied city um and i loved jeremy called something a failure earlier but i think there is some success in failure um and so we were really lucky um five years ago when we formalized the galleries we had a sponsorship by the google brand studio so they created our visual identity and gave us a series of custom designed tools for building a website and building an online exhibition. Um, and in many ways, I, I feel like we, we did a pretty good job. It was a successful project, but we failed several times by the time we got to something that um, we felt was good enough for our very small audience at that time. But it, it that process reminded me as does many of the strange things we're trying now, um, that we need to kind of like constantly be willing to mess up or to have something not work and to not feel terrible if we're not meeting certain goals. Um, that's been really difficult yeah. for me. It's, it's also can be difficult to um, legitimize that, uh, you know, with your directors or provosts in my case. Um, but I think that, or even, you know, students and faculty, uh, I think that museums and galleries, especially in university settings, they, are, they were designed to be uh, think tanks, places where you're trying, if you're not trying something weird, artists are trying something weird. Mm. Um, so I've been trying to, you know, embrace that. Um, and working on an, ex an online exhibition five years ago and developing one now, that's like 
one of the primary um, aspects of the curatorial process is working really hard on something and then realizing after mm-hmm. several um, hours, man hours, team collaboration that it, it's, it doesn't work. You can't, you can't put it out there. <laughs> uh, I wonder if you could tell us about the project you're working on. Because oh, sure. It's born digital. Yeah. Which- it's the language that I am embracing, a born digital project with born digital artwork. Sure. Um, I'll just give a quick little tour. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay. So this is Providence College Gallery's website. Um, five years ago when we launched this website, our first ever, we also commissioned um, and collaborated with Art F City, which is a Uh, an art criticism journal in New York um, to do a survey of animated GIF work. Um, So you can actually enter into the exhibition. um, And all of these are born digital works. Um, The sort of theme of the exhibition is really um, artists thinking about place and how place um, is tangled and mixed up in a post studio era. Um, And especially if you don't have a lot of access to resources or or materials or money, things like that, and how the landscape or space ends up becoming part of the um, studio practice. You start to reimagine the landscape if you you don't actually have access to the landscape, Um, whether that's the built environment or the natural environment. so, you know, this was a pretty huge project. I will tell you that whenever we started working on it, I, I had no clue what I was doing. Um, Art of City, they really knew what they were doing. Um, and they had a really huge understanding of the way that um, born digital work requires actually some site specificity, um, whether that's site specificity within the machine, within the web development platform or um, the institutional resources that are provided to show it. Um, So now, fast forward to today, five years later, we're working on another online exhibition that I'm curating um, based on what I learned from (laughs) Art F City. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um, And that show's called Teco Deco. I love the title, by the way. Thanks. Um, I had an idea, you know, two years ago, thinking about this resurgence of the pattern and decoration. Um, Well, kind of like recontextualizing the movement and thinking about how um, artists are using pattern and decoration, craft, um, artisanal traditions, things like that. And I was seeing a lot of this showing up in born digital work. Um, And so I thought it would be nice to do a survey. So I've been working on the research for that for quite a while, but with the, with the COVID era crisis, um, I have realized that we can continue along on that trajectory and present a beautiful exhibition. Um, But Something that Providence College Galleries does well is um, spread money around to artists who need it, where we have a really robust commissioning program. Um, And we're really interested in helping artists expand their practices. So I've kind of been tweaking the roster, the, you know, the list of works for the show, to incorporate some commissions by artists who do not work digitally or maybe even lack digital skills at all to collaborate with the developers, designers, uh, media producers. Um, And most of these artists are folks who have lost work um, or if they haven't lost work, their, you know, their sales are shrinking um, and they're having to really think about themselves in the, in an online context in a way that they probably never cared to before. And I think that's a really interesting thing um, to incorporate into my curatorial practice because I think of what I do as curating artists, not artworks. Um, 
so taking sort of like that RDF city model of, you know, surveying the field, tracking the field, keeping a record of things, but then finding openings where other people can kind of um, bridge themselves into certain cultures. And, you know, as Jeremy talked about earlier, um, we're realizing that artists have this, uh, you know, experimental fluency with anything they put their hands on. So, um, you know, an artist who knows very little about digital cultures, actually, I'm finding can bring uh, so much, so many new ideas by basically using things wrong in a way that people who know a lot would not be willing to do. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, pretty, that's a pretty exciting um, side effect, I think. And we've, you and I've talked about how much I love de-skilled <laughs> objects. And so this is also a, this is a challenge for you too. And outside your curatorial comfort zone, which I love. And I think all of us need to be pushed into that zone if, if there ever was a time. Um, I will say that I have been pushed into that zone as a viewer through this online exhibition conversation that we're having and that it forced me to really dive into what's happening at institutions across the world. Uh, of course, there's the um, initial impetus of this conversation, which was, as I shared with you all before, the AAMG listserv full of people struggling to put student and faculty exhibitions online at the end of the semester with no tech support um, with just a couple faculty uh, involved or maybe just a couple staff members and watching people try out Smartify or AutoCAD or um, I mean the real estate software that allows people to show their homes in, in 3D. Um, but my myself, I found out of balance and, and um, challenged by going on to the really sophisticated website, say the New Museum and Rhizomes recent, um, let me quickly look, we link 10 easy pieces, which was just launched recently. I was completely disoriented and it made me realize that and empathize with visitors that enter our institutions and aren't completely comfortable going into museums and galleries, right? So I've been doing this since I was, um, gosh, I think probably all of us we were going to galleries and museums in our um, cities as we were growing up. I think I've had conversations with all of you about our home, home-based institutions. Mine was the Carnegie Museum of Art and the Warhol, which opened when I was 15. So there's a comfort level I have. I know how to navigate. I don't need to ask for directions. I know how to read didactics. But going into these, these online spaces, these born digital exhibitions that are, that are properly born digital exhibitions, I find myself confused. I don't realize that I need to download apps. Um, I'm not good at following directions because I haven't followed directions in a gallery for 30, I don't know, I'm not gonna age myself that much, 20, 25 years. I turned 40 two days from now, so 20, 25 years. Uh, and I don't know if these have been your experiences. Jeremy, you're probably, and, and actually Jamie Lee, um, not to date you, Dominic, but like you guys are actually curating in, in that realm and thinking in that realm, but I, I don't. And I realize that it's given me a lot of empathy for visitors. I already thought I had it, but now it's even deeper after having experienced this kind of disembodied exhibition um, navigation that, is, that has really been difficult for me and not particularly enjoyable. Yeah. And maybe if I do it enough, I'll become more adept at it. It's really sometimes like hard to know where to invest your energies when there's so many options out there. Um, and there are a lot of companies, especially now, um, that are targeting museums um, with a very specific product and, in, and encouraging us to, that this will solve all of our, our needs. And um, it's disorienting um, and just overwhelming. And oftentimes um, uh, there is a focus on the technology rather than the basics. And I oftentimes feel like the technology um, gets in the way as someone who you know is in charge of our digital presence and sometimes it's about um, simplifying it to the experience that you're trying to achieve and really just letting that be your guiding light um, I've like not engaged at all with any apps I found that um, in for the museum um, and I it's because I've um, 
we through looking at the analytics, we find that there's a huge drop off it when you ask when someone needs to download something onto their personal device. I'm not really interested in doing that. And so um, we always look for like simpler web based solutions to problems and really focus on like like the basics um, because it's less disorienting for a visitor. Um, and it's much more important to focus on how it fits into your wayfinding system than anything else. And so there's a project that we worked on recently um, called Soundwalks. Um, and it was connected to a very specific exhibition, um, Gorham Silver, um, that the museum had um, uh, some months back. <coughs> and we created a, a, a tour that came across a web browser but the thing that kind of guided you rather than any sort of like really complicated like Wi-Fi tracking or anything like that was a story. And, um, and when we were testing this, no one got lost. People were still able to kind of move through a space because it connected to things that felt familiar. And the technology then became seamless. And, um, and, you, and it was like forgot, it didn't matter what it was delivered on. Um, because there was strong content. Well, it's like the kind of challenges that happened with early video art, where yeah. you, know, you had half of it that was like too tech oriented and kind of build in that regard, but then you had another half that was being done by like Bruce Nauman and Guido Conchi, people who were really adept at just making art, um, who were just kind of moving the technology over to where they were. And I think that would be one of the things that we have to offer as museums, as curators, is we know how to organize this material. We know how to, like, as, as I think Jeremy indicated, tell a story uh, with this stuff and not let the tech in the way, but just sort of make the tech work the way that we try to make our spaces work, the way that we try to allow artists to kind of make these spaces work uh, with their art. So, um, you know, I think that that's, you know, kind of maybe one of the things that is something that we all kind of maybe worry about because we're supposed to be, you know, our terrain is like presenting these authentic experiences with tangible objects. Uh, but perhaps this will really kind of reveal that we do have this other, the skill set that we have within the realm of the tangible, within a sort of like actual space is something that also translates and continues yeah. to translate. And, and the trick is always like trying to also like, generate content that tran transcends space in general. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that why Raid, the Icebox now is something that's like holding up while the museum is, co is closed um, because it, it, it's, it, it's, it's um, yeah, it's made for web. Um, yeah. yeah, and, and curators are such an important link between uh, the institution and audiences as well as visitor services, security guards are so important. Um, talk to your security guards about how people are experiencing exhibitions. That's one of the most important advice uh, pieces I give to young curators. Um, but in, in that way of thinking and in talking about apps, I do worry that as, as we turn to more surveillance to open our institutions, which is going to be necessary, we're gonna require people to wash hands, to not touch things, to, you know, we're not going to be like Chinese museums that are requiring you to put in your national ID number and register for a specific time. It's not gonna be quite that bad. And my husband is about to get home and the dogs are gonna go crazy. <laughs> I apologize, I, it's coming. Um, <laughs> But uh, I do think that we have to, as curators, really fight to make sure that the hurdles that are already in place for people don't want to come to our institutions um, don't become higher or more difficult to, to, uh, to, to move through because we have apps that are required to fully um, engage with an exhibition. And I think about with that with audiences, I mean, certainly we're not going to have things that we hand out that people touch. Uh, and more than one person touches, we're not going to have our visitor services staff disinfecting things constantly. But that's my biggest concern with apps, is that as people feel more surveilled, having to download an app for an institution is going to take on a more nefarious tone than maybe it did previously. I'm sorry that that was so long. That was me getting distracted as um, there was chaos. Um, can I ask a question about that? Has, I, has anyone... I mean, this is probably mostly for Jeremy and Dom. Have 
have the institutions you've worked at used apps at all? Uh, Cam St. Louis did, but it was, I can't, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think it was introduced a bit kind of midstream as to while I was there and I think it was used for kind of other means. It wasn't, uh, I don't know. I do think that we all kind of live off them already. I think, you know, if we've, I guess we're all in the matrix already. It's just like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not worried about. It. I mean, it, it, I'm worried about being surveilled, but I've already kind of given myself over to it. There, I don't like there, single use apps, but <laughs> there are also like institutions that um, do use surveillance in the creation of exhibitions um, uh, to figure out whether or not like how an exhibition is constructed works in the space, because we can use our our Wi-Fi beacons to just track individuals. Mm -hmm. um, like, it's kind of like we are living in a dystopia already. Um, oh, and <laughs> I know that. I just mean that I, I was, I think it was Michelle Fisher, who we're all friends with and who um, I did a conversation with last month, uh, was sharing a conversation about successful apps at major institutions. I mean, SFMOMA, institutions that have that level of budget where they can make their own apps and that those were successful models. And I... I know that at the Bell, we're thinking about Smartify, not necessarily for the Bell, but for Nicole's campus collection, which is housed in historical homes and buildings across Brown's campus. Um, so it would be more permanent. And so doing a Smartify app where you, if you're a student, you can just have it on your phone. And if you're curious about something that's in a building that you have a class in, you can just hold it up and it'll tell you what it is. I think that's actually a really yeah. great thing to have. Um, I was just curious, yeah, if, uh, if anyone else was thinking um, SF Mom is like a really good example because um, what they made um, was amazing um, using their app. It was like the only time I've seen a museum have a tremendously successful app uh, that was um, um, really uh, meant something to download. Like you got an experience. Um, and they were working with a company called Detour, um, which um, uh, they're in entire business model essentially failed. And they're, and so SFMOMA overnight lost their app. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it was like this, um, and it was like a real tremendous shame because it was amazing. Um, the dirty secret among uh, museum technologists is um, that oftentimes people just aren't using them. There's a lot of institutions, um, and I won't throw out any names, but um, have that have like big, sometimes multi-million dollar projects um, and um, that they've spent so much time executing and so much resources executing. And then it's just like, uh, no one's using it, um, which is such a shame. Um, and then when there is like a private company that when you pair up with, uh, sometimes you can make an amazing thing and it just poof, disappears. So. It's a really hard balance to figure out. And this might be an unanswerable question, but Jeremy, if say that there was a university gallery that only had a couple staff members and they needed to make a virtual exhibition, what are the bare minimums? Because I'm really hoping that this video um, is for that audience as well, uh, for people that are, that are struggling, facing down a potential shutdown that might extend until next year, um, how to get exhibitions that are not yet in existence into online spaces, if that's even possible, and what you can do if you are not a coder. Um, maybe, at, for instance, at Brown, we have to use WordPress. We just learned that we can't use, we might be able to use Smartify, but in terms of an online, ex, like a web-based exhibition, we would have to use WordPress. So we're just trying to think through these, yeah. these options. With, and it, you know, no budget because all yeah. of our budgets are getting yeah. cut. Yeah. It, Make it happen. Magically tell us with the... Uh, it, it was, it's really hard if you haven't already done some of the work. Um, and, it, that, and that's just the truth of it. Um, it it's like hard to change um, like an institutional like uh, relationship with, with technology, um, uh, let alone like the, the workflows that it, you know, that are set up already to make content. Um, and the museum, um, our museum uh, 
actually, as part of the Raid the Icebox Now exhibition, made a publishing platform um, because we found that um, not there weren't any like easy solutions for us, and that and because we've invested in an infrastructure, um, it's the thing that um, and that it's something that is made by artists, that it's something that's flexible, um, it's nimble. Those are the things that allow us to do any project that comes up. Like we're able to publish oh, no, no problem right now. And I think that um, um, it's important for institutions to pair up um, and work together on these things um, because it's dumb that the museum made its own platform, even though I'm saying it's, it's, it's allowed us to do all of these things, because it's a tremendous amount of money um, that we've had to invest in it. Um, and so it's like, I know that we are interested in sharing um, any of the, the technology that we make. Um, and there are a lot of examples in the museum world where um, other institutions are, are working together. Anyone's interested in using our platform, let me know. Let's make it happen. No, thank you. I think collaboration is going to be vital for all of us in both exhibition making physically for years to come, but also for reaching audiences and just sharing what's working and what isn't yeah. as we try these different um, methods, platforms. Yeah. I would give a plug too to so, and something a little more, um, you know, DIY. Uh, some of us are um, met in Chicago our first time. And our colleague, um, Julie rodriguez Widow, um, who's uh, the director and chief curator at the DePaul Art Museum, uh, she has been putting together, um, taking the beautiful exhibition photography that every museum has. Um, Eric Gould's a fabulous exhibition photographer for RISD Museum and our exhibition photographer, Scott Alario, we just have troves of the most beautiful installation documentation. So Julie has taken theirs and created tours of current and past exhibitions where she's reading her didactics um, as essentially a slideshow changes, um, putting it on their YouTube channel. And it's, it is, you know, it's not an online exhibition, but it's an experience that, um, it, especially if you like looking at art and architecture um, on your computer screen, screen, it's something that's pretty um, satisfying and educational. And I also realized how much more I was um, taking in her uh, writing and, and interpretation in a way that I sometimes skim over when I'm actually yeah. in the gallery. Um, so, you know, that's something that almost anyone can do. Yeah. Uh, with computer and, and I really appreciate it. I, I think we're probably going to copy that idea over there. <laughs> Not to immediately contradict myself, but getting back to the accessibility question um, and just general access, I mean, the alternative is not doing something. And um, like Jamie Lee's example is like a really good example of, of actually taking action so that people can engage in some way with you. Um, and, and the alternative is like, not doing it and just having emptiness, which is a, not a really great thing either. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I think some institutions went into this thinking they could ride that, ride it out that way, that it would be, would be shut down for a month, maybe two. And I mean, one of the points I wanted to circle back to is the idea of what curatorial labor is and how that's going to change in the shutdown and how it's valued within your institution because a lot of us could be spending time doing research on future projects. And I'm sure Jeremy, you're in the same position that, that putting 700 students online took a lot of time away from other projects that you could be working on. And that the type of research and also the personal relationships that we're maintaining through Zoom. And my husband's like, you're on Zoom all the time, but this is, these are the conversations I'd be having with artists and with curators and colleagues in real life if, um, if that were possible. And it's such a huge part of what curators do. I hope that that's not lost as we move online. And I also hope that the talent that I can say this with complete honesty, Jamie Lee and Dominic, you are such talented installers and a lot of people in our field are not. And that's why your photos look so good. And I think we need to acknowledge that is that bad installation. And some people just don't have that sense of space. They might be brilliant writers and have, you know, 
wonderful relationships with artists, but to actually install a show and make it look good and make the objects have conversations that, that elevate the objects is actually a talent that I don't think you can learn in any type of curatorial program or art history program. And I wonder how that's going to translate online. And if we're going to maybe start being critical because people are being critical about how online exhibitions are being put together in a way that they're not critical of the way exhibitions are hung in art criticism at this moment, because our art critics, a lot of them don't, don't think about that or don't understand that you don't get every object you want from your wish list. And maybe that's because of a review mm -hmm. the Reed Morton show got where I'm like, MoMA, lent us the work and then put a loan moratorium. It's not that I forgot to put it in the <laughs> exhibition, right? So the, 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 the nuts and bolts of actually exhibition making um, are, are actually you're freed from it because maybe in your online exhibition, you can put that image of the object that would never get loaned in real life because it hasn't left the institution in 40 years. I don't know, I just threw a lot at you, but that's what I've been thinking about too. Thank you, Kate. I think it's because you listen to preparators. Um, and as much as I listen to, you know, Stephen Wing on, you know, kind of how to, you know, really <coughs> what, what's best in, in terms of the work in the gallery and, and you know, kind of follow their lead and their sense of space. You know, I similarly with Jeremy, you know, especially on the Raid the Icebox Now uh, publication, you know, Jeremy's instincts, uh, his you know, Carson Evans and Brendan Campbell and other folks who worked, Carolyn Gennari, who all worked on, you know, that uh, publication, you know, you really try to trust their skills and their expertise uh, in terms of, um, you know, how they are going to shape that. And, you know, it's like, just be a good listener. Yeah. And um, I would also say that um, since one of the preparators that I rely on most heavily is uh, helping us with this conversation today. Um, you know, it, preparators are the most important collaborators. And I think um, going forward, especially as we're producing um, media-based content, um, the graphic designers are um, going to be, they, all, they already are so important to the field and they don't get very much recognition. Um, our um, design and communications associate, Elizabeth Corkery, um, she's as much a curator as she is those other things because we think through, we have such a small team that we have to really think through every scenario before we get, you know, the contracted labor into the galleries. And um, designers are artists as well. And so they're, they're able to really kind of uh, give you ideas that you know you would otherwise I would otherwise not have so I'm very appreciative of um, the Nishans and uh, Liz's of the world because that's how we can install a beautiful show here and then our photographer Scott Alario um, helps me think a lot about viewpoints uh, before I had beautiful documentation I didn't think as much about what it is to have a vignette in a space um, a vignette that's based on a real experience and also a vignette that's going to um, serve you well in the documentation for your publication or your website or so on and so forth. So those people, they really do, um, they're the resources of the curator um, as much as any academic training or um, other professional experience. I agree. I think that the preparators, they're artists and they know what, how to make artwork look as good as possible. And they care deeply about what they're doing with you in the space. So that's one of the early lessons and probably from, oh, we should actually tell our audience that both Jimmy Lee and I worked with Dominic, our reluctant mentor Dominic, um, many years ago at the MCA Chicago. We were there at different times, but Dominic, you, I think, have been so, um, you've been so clear in your valuing of preparators and security and frontline staff. And I think I've worked with a lot of other colleagues who have been as well, but that early experience probably shaped Jamie Lee's and my thinking about that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Chicago is known to have the most uh, serious competitive preparators in the world. It was a very intense, <laughs> intense installation environment at the MCA, I will say. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, and 
I, I am married to a former preparator, so I've learned the value of um, talking to them, <laughs> not assuming that some, you know, your vision or the artist's vision um, is going to work out. The preparator usually knows what will work and what won't. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And yeah. I think, you know, that translates to, you know, this digital realm that we're going to be in, you know, like, I'm sure that um, I will, the Jeremy's in my life will become, you know, the lifeline to great content. I don't, I don't presume to know um, everything that I need to know to make a perfect exhibition. These people are as much the, the authors as I am. I know that we're actually coming around to a full hour and we could probably have another easily another hour of conversation, but I wanted to end by asking everyone if there have been any exhibition models or online components to be more expansive that you've encountered in the last couple months um, since the shutdown that you thought were really successful. I'll just say that not only do I love Nicole Eisenman's online space and the entire Read the Icebox now, um, and of course, Providence College Galleries has a gorgeous website, and I've already taken a lot of your materials to be like, this is the design that I would love to have, this type of clean, beautifully designed um, ephemera. Uh, my two favorite and the favorite of the Bell staff, um, though Ian and Nishan, you can jump on and say yay or nay, but Joanne and I really like uh, the Eileen Gray exhibition at Bard and the Whitney's Vita Americana. And I know that they're two vastly different institutions and budgets. Um, of course, the Whitney's is huge. And Bard's, um, based on a listserv uh, comment from one of its exhibition creators, it apparently was two people that put that together. But of course, there are also exhibitions that were already installed and had gorgeous exhibition materials and everything was scanned beforehand. And as all of us kind of enter into the fall exhibition, cycle where we don't know yet whether we're going to be allowed to open and, and mount our exhibitions. I don't know what's possible for us, but those are, those are my two favorite so far. I have, uh, one is a bit silly, uh, but the other is um, uh, a young gallery, a new, uh, I'm assuming it's young, it's certainly emerging, a uh, new release uh, gallery. Oh. It's been doing uh, this thing called Decameron Day. Uh, it's a sort of series which looks at the Boccaccio classic as a way to sort of structure um, their kind of ongoing kind of presentation of, of, I think, little curated shows by gallery artists or, or of artists and so forth. Um, but it, I think it's really quite elegant in the way that it kind of ties our current, you know, kind of, the, you know, predicament and, and uh, pandemic to one that happened centuries ago uh, to kind of cross that um, that historical divide but you know provides this really quite ingenious way of structuring uh, kind of an ongoing uh, program the other is um, this thing I think I, I counted it through Kate McGarry gallery who is uh, participating in it called the eye of the collector uh, which is a little bit posh and exclusive but um, it was uh, sort of framing an art fair uh, within this Victorian era kind of mansion, the William Waldorf Astor apartment um, to Temple Place uh, in England. And um, I don't know, it sounds really corny, but it was really well done in terms of situating these works of contemporary art within this you know, kind of Victorian space. And I thought it was, it was kind of fun. I mean, it was, you know, in this time, I think we need certain things that have you know, a certain urgency to them, but also, let's face it, like, we need a Tiger King, too. Um, we, um, we need to have, you know, I, I think it was, but it was also something that, like, what, it was great to work on, you know, especially Nicole's and, and Simone's Raid the Icebox now projects, but I think, I don't know if I, if the other curators were as envious and jealous as I was of the artists that we worked with in terms of having that liberation, lib liberty to kind of use objects in this very expansive and creative way. And so, you know, maybe that kind of presentation is something where, you know, we have the capacity, it's like the animal, what was the animal thing you were talking about? Oh, Animal Crossing. Yeah, you know, having this kind of liberty to sort of place art you know, in, in, I think to, to paraphrase Bob Dylan, like 
gas stations, you know, department stores, like to have this new kind of imaginary space kind of open, potentially open to us to kind of play around in could be really you know, kind of fun and but also, you know, meaningful in, in other ways. So. Um, I have been looking less at online exhibitions and more at um, some of the really fabulous uh, video and media content that's been produced. Um, there's a small production company called Rava Films, um, and they've been doing these short, um, uh, they're like something between looking at um, work in studios, and then also then in exhibition spaces, having artists give the didactic information while you're looking at it doesn't function like a documentary because the cuts are very quick. It's very much about the screen um, uh, and the, how the work looks on the screen. And then they also did a short series of interviews for the Met, for the Met um, with a few celebrities from different fields. And that has really helped me think about the ways that, um, you know, exhibitions could um, live it be time-based um, instead of, you know, a more passive uh, viewing on your screen um, where you can leave and come back, like you have to sit for a whole, for a whole viewing. And I'm kind of interested in that. Um, I, not to get like too philosophical, but um, this is like the only moment in my career uh, that where, um, like both like uh like large media companies and then museums our size seem to be working within the same conditions um and the playing field hasn't necessarily been leveled um but we're all working on with challenges um and i think that when um a couple of months ago everyone was working really reactive um and i see things now changing to being uh, working in a more responsive uh, way um, to the needs of maybe our immediate communities or our larger communities um, as they're coming up. And, um, and it's been really exciting to see that transition and to see how people are like uh, adapting. And, um, and I know that in the future, like the, the world that we will live in will be different. Um, um, we will carry this with us. Um, this experience that we're all going through. And I just, um, uh, it'll be interesting to see what lessons we've learned from, from the experiments that we're working on now. Um, it, um, it is like both terrifying and exciting. So what a weird world do we live in? <laughs> That's the perfect ending to this conversation, yeah. which I really enjoyed. And I appreciate that you're all fairly new physical colleagues, even though I knew a couple of you in advance. Jeremy, I can't wait to meet you in person. It'll happen. <laughs> yep. uh, once we're back in the hood. And uh, thank you again. Um, I'll see you all a lot, probably, in Zooms and texts and everything. But in person, I don't know, a couple months on the other side, as they say. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Nishant. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Kate. Thank you.